Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing today? Good, good, good. Obviously, I'm not Pastor Jim or Miss Tamara. They are currently um, at a meeting where they serve on the board of directors for this organization. And real quick, just so you know where they're at and what they're being a part of, I wanted to read you some stats because it's so cool what our pastors get to do. They're with the organization that provides training and resources to 3 million house churches and 38 million Christians who live in some of the darkest, most dangerous places to be a Christian. And this organization has rescued 650,000 children and returned them uh, when they were taken to be soldiers, sex slaves, or child brides. So my dad called me this morning and he was like, hey, and I was like, it's early, what's up? And he was like, feels so weird not to be at church, but you tell everybody that I miss them, I love them, I'm excited to see them back next week. But also, how cool is it that they get to be part of a work that's doing that much in the world? I'm so glad that our pastors and us, by extension, get to be a part of that. They didn't watch first service, but I know they're watching now. My mom just texted me right before I got up here. So, uh, love you guys, and the church loves you guys, right? Right? They're here, I promise. There are people in the building. I don't know if you can see them. But we're excited for when you guys get back. Well, today we are continuing our series, Synced. We have been looking at the book of Ephesians and we've been talking about the type of faith that we should have. If you've been here, you know that in week one, we talked about a bolder faith. Week two, we talked about a better faith. Week three, we talked about belonging faith. And today I wanna talk to you about building faith, a faith that is growing us and growing the people around us. So, you know, I don't like to be up here by myself. Talk back to me. Everybody say, building faith. faith. We'll be looking at Ephesians 4, uh, verses 14 through 16. It's only three verses, but man, these three verses pack a punch. There's a lot of spiritual truth in them. You could preach several sermons, several different ways. But without doubt, one of the main ideas that Paul is trying to get across is the importance of truth. Because... If you're going to have a building faith, you are not going to be able to grow or build if you do not know truth or if you're not able to accept truth or if you can't tell the difference of what's true and what's false. And I, don't, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think we don't always like the truth. And there's a reason we have that saying, the truth hurts. You ever heard that saying? I remember when I was a toddler, I would do things that I wasn't supposed to, which might surprise you. And sometimes... I wouldn't get caught, right? I wouldn't get caught in the moment, but I'd leave traces. I was a, not a smooth criminal. I'd leave broken things or, you know, the wall would be colored on. This particular time, Emily was crying, like I pulled her hair or something. Not important, right? Toughen up. But my mom would try to extract the truth from me and she would put me on the counter and y'all, my mom's five foot maybe, but when she's fired up, you don't mess with her. Like, you know you done messed up if she's mad. So she would put me on the counter and she'd say, Jeffrey, tell me the truth. And I would look at her and I'd say, the truth. <laughs> <laughs> except, except it wasn't that cool because I couldn't say my R. So she's like, tell me the truth. And I'd be like, the truth. Why? Because the truth was about to hurt. I talked to this guy, uh, my friend, and he said his dad had to go to the doctor because he was, you know, seeing some signs that maybe something could be wrong. Sure enough, the doctor told him, he was like, look, man, you're going to have to start eating healthier. You're going to start working out. You're going to have to start taking these medications. And I was trying to make my friend feel better about it, right? So I was like, well, at least, you know, your dad knows what to do. And my friend was like, that's what I said. But when I asked my dad how it was going, he said, son, it's just so hard to find a new doctor. <laughs> hey, man. Don't hate. It's human nature to avoid the truth. We do it with mothers. We do it with doctors. We will do it with pastors in churches. If they tell us something we don't want to hear, well, I'm going to go find a new church. Why? Because somebody fed you the truth in a way that was going to make you grow, but you didn't want to hear it. Hey, I'm guilty of it too. We all act like we want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But sometimes when it comes down to it, we can't handle the truth. Myself included, I'm putting myself in that box. The natural tendency is to kind of get uncomfortable with the truth. But I love what we're studying today. Ephesians 14, 15, and 16. Because in, in verse 15, Paul says something, and I think it's very important. He says, instead, we will speak the truth in love. Help me, I'll say truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, 
the church. Building faith, as you'll see, isn't just truth. Building faith is truth in love because truth without love is brutality, is brutal. Love without truth is hypocrisy, is the hypocrite. But truth in love is how we get to maturity. Really, this is the whole passage, and the whole passage is pointing to what does it look like to spiritually grow up? It's okay to start as a baby Christian. We all do. I mean, we're born again. That's what the Bible says. The Christian life is not a continuum of any other life, but we shouldn't stay there. And today I'm going to talk to you about how if we can get truth and love right, then it'll contribute to our maturity, our stability, and our community. Here's the passage we're looking at. I'll be referring to it back and forth, but I'm just going to read it all, get a lay of the land. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. It says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, I'm going to spend the whole sermon unpacking those three verses. But real quick, I don't want to talk to you about truth and love. I want to talk to you about lies like truth. Did you catch what Paul said? He said in verse 14 and 15a, if you have your little notes, I think those are helpful. I highlighted some stuff on there. He says this. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. And I just relate to that, man. You ever turn off the TV or a social media app and you're like, I don't even know what's true. That sounded right, but I'm so confused. People try to trick us with lies like truth. But he said instead, we'll speak the truth in love. You know what's interesting is when Paul describes the people who trick us with lies like truth. He uses this adjective to describe them that the Bible uses to describe the serpent in Genesis. He says they're clever or crafty. So real quick, I just want to show you how the enemy deceives us with lies like truth. Because if we do not know how to discern lies like truth, we will stay spiritual infants for our whole life. In Genesis, I'm sure we all know this, but Adam and Eve, they're living in perfection, but they have one rule. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so, of course, the serpent slides in to tempt them to eat from that tree. And at first Eve stays strong. She's like, no, God said, if we eat from this tree, we will die. Now watch, watch how the the enemy tricks them and deceives them. You ready? Genesis three, four through five. He said, you won't die. The servant replied to the woman. Verse five, God knows that. One, your eyes will be opened. Remember that. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And number two, you'll be like God knowing both good and evil. So they believe, they take a bite. Now watch what happens, you ready? Genesis 3, 7. At that moment, they took a bite. Their eyes were opened. Oh, that's what he said. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Hey, their eyes were open. Here's a question. Did the devil lie? Y'all look real confused. What'd you learn in church today? Ah, the, de- the devil tells the truth? What church you go to? No, 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 no. The devil, he tells lies like truth. But the part that he leaves out, the part that he hides from you, is the part that will always end up damaging your life. And if you do not know how to distinguish truth and love with lies like truth... You're going to stay a spiritual infant. So I just wrote down three lies like truth, little half truths. I think we believe all the time. You ready? Here's one. Man, you are young. Live your life how you want. It doesn't matter. But let me hide the fact that you're developing habits that ain't just going to go away one day. Let, Let me hide the fact that one day you might carry some baggage into another season of life that really hurts people that you love. And let me hide the fact that you will neglect the work God can do in you now as a young person because you have the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. You don't have a junior Holy Spirit. God can be working in you now, giving you the confidence and the maturity to not let anybody look down on you, but to be an example even in high school. You gotta be careful of lies like truth. Here's another lie like truth we often believe. You don't love your wife anymore. You deserve to be happy. Ooh. 
I like to be real because I know somebody in here is thinking it. You don't love your wife anymore. You deserve to be happy. But let me hide the fact. Love is an action. Let me hide the fact that if you don't let God change some things on the inside of you, then whatever problems you have in this relationship is just going to carry on to the next one you start. And, and, and most of all, let me hide the fact that if you humble yourself at the feet of God, he and he alone can change your heart and make it capable of love again. Make it capable of restoration again. Make it capable of family again. you got to be careful about lies like truth. Last one, half-truths. Hey, it's your money. You earned it. Spend it how you want. But let me hide the fact that somebody gave you gifts and ability. Let me hide the fact that health and the ability to produce wealth is a gift from God, and he could take it in a second. It is his breath in our lungs. And most importantly, let me hide the fact that God said the most free people are generous people. Let me hide the fact that Jesus said, more blessed is it to give than it is to receive. Listen, if we are going to grow up, we got to learn truth and love and be able to discern lies like truth. The devil will give you half-truths that keep you spiritual infants, but we're not going to be like that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Y'all out there? All right. So not lies like truth. Instead, Paul gives us an alternative. Truth in love. So for the rest of this message, I want to show you that truth in love will help us in our maturity, our stability, and our community. Now, if you read these verses carefully, verse 14, 15, 16, Paul's doing something kind of clever. He will list what it looks like to be a spiritual baby in verse 14, and then he'll interject truth in love. And then he'll say the exact opposite in 15 and 16. So watch this. I'll give you the first example. In 14a, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children, right? And then in uh, 15, he says, instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing. And never, so it's not children anymore now because the truth in love, we're, we're growing. And the first thing living the truth in love does is it turns infancy to maturity. We know this instinctively. Like in our personal lives. First off, the older we are, the more we can handle the truth. Right? That's why when your four-year-old's like, Mommy, where do babies come from? You're not like, sit down. <laughs> Let me teach you the inner workings of the reproductive system. No. That'd be weird. You're like, storks, Santa Claus. My parents told me Target. <laughs> they did. I ain't lying. They, they, my, it was a sick joke, honestly. It's, it's not funny. They would tell me I was from Target. And like until I was like seven years old, my mom would take me to the dog bed aisle, like where the dog beds are. You know, you go, Maddie, you know what I'm talking about. You turn right. And, and they, they would literally be like, this is where you, we got you. And I'd be like, where are all the other ones? I, well, I guess I was the last. But as your kid gets older, then you start telling them the truth. Because we instinctively know the older you are, the more truth you can handle. And not only that, but when you tell them the truth, it's typically because you want them to handle and live out that truth more responsibly. But we don't always connect that with our faith. The truth is, as we grow up spiritually, we should be increasing in the truth we know about God. And then we should be living that truth out in the world more responsibly. Paul actually gets mad at the Corinthian church because they're staying spiritual children their whole life. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3a, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would talk to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. He says, I had to feed you with milk, not solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready. Why? Verse 3, you're still controlled by your sinful nature. They were staying spiritual babies. The milk, it was fine for a season, but the milk should have caused them to grow as it causes a baby to grow. But the Corinthians didn't. They would just neglect the truth they didn't like and they would stay stuck on the same level. And if we aren't careful, we can do the same thing. If we're not careful, we can sit in church for decades, neglect the truth that we don't like. And then you look back and you're like, man, I've been in church for years, but Am I any kinder? Am I any different? Am I any more generous? Am I any less prideful? God doesn't want us to stay stuck as spiritual babies. Living the truth in love should cause us to go from infancy to maturity. It should cause our character to change. In fact, this is kind of nerdy, but when Paul says speaking the truth in love, in the original language in Greek, it doesn't really say that. Truth is a verb. It says truthing in love. 
Truth, that's not even an English equivalent, but true thing in love is getting across the point that we are to act differently because of Jesus as we mature. So when we're trying to gauge building faith and are we growing, the first question, I'm going to give you three. The first question we ask ourselves is, is my character growing? Help me out. Say character. Okay. And not just behavior, but your heart. Like look back on a year and say, am I any more generous? Am I more trusting of God's plan? Am I more kind to people? That's all I'm going to say about this because really the next two things that Paul says are just further examples of what it looks like to be a spiritual baby. He says in Ephesians 4, 14a, then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed about or tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. And then he says the opposite in 1516a. He says, instead, we'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. Watch this. He makes the whole body fit together. So you are tossed and blown about, but you interject truth and love, and now you are fit together. And the second thing that I want to tell you is living the truth in love turns tossed about into fit together. What does Paul mean? He's talking about stability. Babies are some of the least stable things in the world. You don't got to be a parent to know. I'm just the uncle, right? A, a little baby could have the worst day. They're like six years old, packing their little Hello Kitty backpack. They're like, I'm moving out. And then you could be like, do you want to get ice cream? And they're like, hmm. <laughs> you have changed me. My, uh, my nephew Copeland, I love that little guy. But he's a handful. And uh, I was doing a wedding the other day. And, you know, as the pastor, you're looking out at the congregation. And little man was in, in dress clothes. And he does not like dress clothes. Honestly, the kid don't like clothes in general. He's a nudist. He's a passionate nudist. Um, am I wrong? Just, just like it's, never mind. Uh, I stopped, Mike. I stopped. At least he's not a Buddhist. Okay. So I'm doing this wedding. And you could just see, like, he'd get this little look on his face. And he was about to just wreak havoc in the middle of the wedding. And I'm like, Coat, please, dude, just shut up, please. And so his mom is smart, right? His mom always, always strapped with fruit snacks. So I don't even know if she knew I saw this. But every time Copeland was like, this is the worst day in the world. I'm going to yell about it. Fruit snack. <laughs> and I just would watch as I'm doing this wedding. He'd be like, hmm. Mm. Am I wrong? You know I'm not wrong. Hey, why? Children are not stable. And Paul says, you know what? Neither are baby Christians. Baby Christians, it's so easy to toss them to and fro. They're not consistent because they don't know what to believe. So baby Christians, let me give you some examples. For instance, like a baby Christian will hear a sermon and they'll be like, Woo, that's the best sermon. I'm ready to live this out. Three days later, I uh, forgot what it was about. <laughs> baby Christians are the type that they'll pray one week and God will answer their prayer. Oh, God loves me. And then they'll pray two, three weeks later and God will say no. Or God will say wait. And they're like, I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if he cares about me. It's back and forth. There's no stability in a baby Christian. Or another way they're uh, unstable, or unstable is in the inability to accept delayed gratification. Right? Babies are into deliverance now. So like, God, I'm going to do right and you... Deliver me now. And if, if it doesn't happen, they're out. They're all in, then they're all out. They're all in. But like, like when Paul said, God, I got a thorn in my flesh. Deliver me from it. God said, no. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul, in other words, carry on. Do what you know to be doing and trust that my grace is going to get you where you need to go. That's called long obedience in the same direction. But baby Christians do not understand long obedience in the same direction. They'll obey, but if God doesn't work on my times table, then I'm no longer all in. Now I'm all out. There's this tossed about to and fro. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Living the truth in love makes you go from tossed about to fit together. You're stable. It's a good reminder that consistency is a good sign of spiritual maturity. Consistency is a good sign of spiritual maturity, relational consistency, emotional consistency, spiritual consistency. So as we're gauging spiritual maturity and how are we growing, it's good to ask, is my character growing? But the next thing that's good to ask is, is my consistency growing? Help me out, say consistency. Am I a consistent friend? Am I emotionally all over the place or do I really believe what God says over my life so I'm pretty level-headed? 
In my spiritual practices, church, in reading and praying, am I consistent? That's a good thing to ask. Paul says living the truth in love makes us go fit together, stable. And finally, Paul says one more thing. It's another sign of spiritual immaturity, but it's also the reason that we're often unstable. In 14b, he says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Now, the other way Paul says we're spiritual babies is that we're easily tricked. Now, this is a totally a sign of a baby. I love how gullible babies are. I tell a baby, like, I'm 6'2". They're like, really? <laughs> yes. Go tell everyone. <laughs> They're just so easy to trick. That's why I believed I was from Target. But Paul says... That's what, Paul says the sign of a spiritual baby is that they're still so easy to trick. They don't know what to believe. They hear one thing and they're like, yes. And then they hear something else and they're like, well, what's true? I don't know. They'll get off, you know, stop getting your theology from TikTok and Instagram, please. But they'll stop. I don't know what to believe anymore. And Paul is saying that we're easily tricked, but he's not just saying that. He's saying a little bit more. Stay with me because he's also in the words he's using Showing us not that we are tricked, but how we are tricked. When he says we are tricked, he uses this Greek word, kubea. And it was basically a reference to gambling, which is really interesting. I think it's the only time that it's used in the Bible. It's a reference to gambling. It comes from the Greek like cube or dice, because you roll the dice, right? And so when people would say kubea, like he says right here, they would use it to mean something like what we mean when we say, oh, you're playing with a loaded dice, meaning the odds are stacked against you, my friend. People gambled all the time in Paul's day, so much so that the Romans had to make it illegal. And, uh, you know, when you make things illegal, everybody obeys the law, right? No. So people kept doing it. Why? Because it was appealing. You had this mindset of like, oh, I'm going to hit it big. But, you know, in gambling, the odds are always stacked against you, even today. Gambling has this way of making you think, we leaving rich today, boys, you know? Here's, yes. And really, it's very self-serving in the sense that all you're there to do is get your money, get out. It's very self-serving, and it's very ineffective. You want to know how I know? Because casinos stay in business. So despite the appeal, you're probably not going to hit it big, and the odds are stacked against you. That's how gambling has always worked. Now, take it back to Paul. What's interesting is Paul says, This is how spiritual babies get tricked. In the same way that gambling can trick you into this self-serving like, oh, I'm going to hit it big. Bad Bible teaching will sell you on this Christianity that's all about you. Very self-serving. Oh, I'm going to hit it big. Everything's going to go great for me. And he flips it and does the opposite one more time in verse 16. He says, that's not what Jesus does. Jesus makes the whole body fit together. As each part does its own special work, it helps other parts grow. It helps other parts grow so that the whole body's healthy, growing, full of love. So so it's not all about being deceived to hit it big. It's about doing your part to help others grow. And so the last thing that living the truth in love does is it turns self-seeking to community developing. Self-seeking to community developing. I love this hidden metaphor because the temptation I think we all face is to chase a life of self-seeking. And and we can do that and in the process neglect friends, neglect family, neglect church family. And as appealing as it is to chase this life that benefits me and call it some form of spirituality, the odds are always stacked against us. Not living to help other people is how community crumbles. It's how church crumbles. It's how family crumbles. You go in thinking, ooh, I'm going to hit it big. And you might, but eventually what you wake up and you find is that a self-serving life is playing with loaded dice. A self-serving life is always playing with loaded dice. The odds are always against you because you chase self-serving and eventually you woke up broke when it came to people that you were supposed to be helping. You hear it about it all the time. And I'm not here to throw stones because Lord knows I'm not perfect. But you, you know that you hear examples of people, I'm just not close with my family. And you kind of got to ask the question, well, did you invest in much as them as you did in trying to chase money and retire early? Because where you invest is where it's going to pay off. You wake up with a spouse you can't stand and 
the whole marriage, you got to ask, was it me living to please myself or were we really trying to build each other up? Wake up to a school system that you complain about, but you got to ask the honest question, what am I doing to help develop those people around me and make the change I can? Listen, living the truth in love will change your mind from being self-seeking to community developing. And if you want to know how you can know if you're on your way to spiritual maturity, ask yourself, am I more about myself or am I more about helping other people? A, b- a baby, they know a few words. Mine, no, mine, right? They, the last thing they're going to do is they're, they're not going to help anybody. And Paul says it's kind of the same with Christians. We can get tricked into this false spirituality where it's all about us. But the sign that you're on the way to really being a mature Christian is when you're living to build other people up. So as we're gauging ourselves, we can't just ask, is my character growing? We can't just ask, is my uh, consistency growing? The last thing we got to ask is, is my community growing? The people around me, the people that God put in my life, are they growing? In verse 16, he says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body's healthy, growing, full of love. That means as you are healthy, you will help other people be healthy. And by contrast, it means if you're not healthy, there might be people who are suffering because you're not healthy. The reason this blew my mind, and I love this metaphor, is because in high school, I went to a chiropractor because my back was all jacked up. The chiropractor checked everything out and he told me, he said, you know, Jeffrey, your back hurts, but it's not really your back's fault. It's your hamstrings fault. He said, your hamstrings are so not flexible. I get that from my dad. We, we can't sit Indian style. He said, your, your hamstrings are so not flexible. And as long as that's the case, your back will always keep getting hurt. So the health of my back really depended on the health of my hamstrings. And Paul compares the body of Christ to a body who when one part is healthy, you're making other parts thrive. So here's a sobering question for you. Whose health and growth is depending on you? Whose health and growth is depending on you to be healthy? Healthy, Your family, your friends, somebody in the next generation who needs a spiritual mother or spiritual father. Listen, I get excited when I think about the body of Christ being what we're called to be. Not just self-serving, looking out for ourselves, but people who are being built up by Christ and in turn building up other people so that our communities look better because there's a church that chooses to live like Christ and mature in his truth. That's a good sign. I'm, I feel like it's a good, a good part to stop here and just say, man, I'm so thankful. I can look around this church and sometimes it's weird to speak of this church because I grew up in it, but I can look around this church and I see so many people who poured into me who because they were healthy and they were mature, made me so much more healthy and more mature by consequence. That's such a blessing. I look around and I see people who would give me godly encouragement, godly conviction, godly advice. It takes a village isn't just a saying in the world, it's the truth of the church. And so as we are processing what it looks like to be spiritually mature Christians, we have to ask, is my community growing? So let me end with a little bit of application. How do we grow into a building faith? a mature faith. I would say this. Think about it like this. How do you make sure that you are physically healthy? Right? Any doctor, any nutritionist, they're going to tell you two things. They're going to say diet and exercise. Boo, just playing. Love diet and exercise. I heard this, uh, this preacher one time. He's like, you want to know why I don't diet? Just think about the two syllables. Die. It. And I thought it was funny. Uh, that was free. But really, diet and exercise. There's an input. What do you put into your body? And then there's an output. What are you doing? And those two things are kind of how you get physically healthy. Now, here's my question to you. Does the fact that somebody eats well and exercises mean they are healthy or is it how they got healthy? I'll ask it again. Is the fact that somebody eats well and exercises, input, output, is that what means they are healthy or is it how they get healthy? It's both. You can't pick one. And honestly, it's the same in our faith. Listen, really, Ephesians 4, we're studying 14 through 16. But if you zoom out and you look at the whole thing, Paul just gets done talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, and how it's our job to equip the church, a.k.a. with the word of God, to eat. There's an input so that they can go and do, a.k.a. exercise the word, out in the world. There has to be an input and an output. You come to God's house, not just to gather, but to be sent. 
on a mission right afterwards. Your mission is to go bring healing and health to your community. So like right after Mike gets up here and he does the blessing, you know? Faith family, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. Is that pretty good? They locked me in the drum cage for years, coming for my revenge. It's fine. Right after Mike gets up here, he does the blessing and he sends you on. That is when church starts, not when it ends. That is when church starts, not when it ends. So we gather to understand the word through qualified teaching, a.k.a. We eat and then we go exercise, a.k.a. we do in the world. Now, here's my new question. Does hearing and doing God's word mean that you are spiritually mature or is it how you get spiritually mature? It's both. So if you're a new Christian and you're like, where do I start? How do I build my, come to church, take notes, get the word of God in you, go home, keep trying to study the best you can and go live it out in the world. If you've been in church for 40 years, how do you stay healthy? You do the same thing. My mom, she's not old, but she says, so I can still be active when I'm old. Doctor told me I got to keep moving to keep moving. And that's the truth. That's the truth in our faith too. It's the same. If we really, really, really want to grow, there's an input and there's an output. This is what Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is all about. In fact, fun fact for you, okay? You're ever at a party and they ask this question, what is the longest scripture in the Bible? Kind of sounds like a lame party, but if they ask that, you're welcome. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is really one super long sentence. So like when I'm preaching 14 to 16, it's not as easy to slice it and organize it and give it to you as I've tried to do. I don't even, I hope it, you know, makes sense. But really, Paul just says this huge long sentence for six verses. And if you really want to boil Paul's one big sentence into one big point, here's what it would be. If you continually learn the word and live the truth in love, you'll become mature and you'll help other people mature. If you continually learn the word and live the truth in love, You'll become mature and you'll help other people mature. That is building faith. And you'll know you're increasing in your faith when three things start to happen. When your character starts to grow, when your consistency starts to grow, and especially when your community starts to grow. If you live like that, you are reaching for a high goal that Jesus set when he said, hey, if you can love God and love other people. Why? Because all the prophets, all the laws of the Bible hang on that developing community, loving people beyond ourselves. And so I just end by saying, let's have a building faith. Let's be synced as a church so that we're being built and we're building other people up. And in doing so, let's be the church that Jesus called us to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. God, that you gave everything you had for us so that we could go and do likewise. God, that you cared about us so much that you humbled yourself. Lord, let us be a humble church that really lives to be the light and develop people so that uh, each generation of this church grows more and more like you. Hey, while we're staying in this attitude of prayer, I wanna ask two questions we ask every time before we get out of here. And here's the first one. If you're in here and you're like, Pastor G, the truth is, I don't even know if Jesus is the Lord and Savior of my life. If I were to take my last breath, I don't know if I'd be in heaven or be in hell, but today something in my heart is stirring. And you say, today I know I need to get my life right with God. If you're in here and that's you, you say, yeah, that's me. I wanna make Jesus the Lord of my life. On the count of three with nobody looking around, just me, would you slip your hand up so I could pray for you where I'm at? One, two, three. I see that hand, see that hand, see that hand. See both of those hands. See that hand up there. See that hand up there. Amazing, amazing. Anybody else wave it at me, I see that hand. Amazing, I see your hand up there. Now let me ask you a second question. If you're up here and you say, Pastor G, at one point I was following God, but the truth is, man, he's not a priority in my life. And today I know that I need to rededicate my life to him. You say today, I know that I need to start a new chapter. If that's you, you say, yep, that's me. I need to rededicate my life. On the count of three, would you just raise your hand? One, two, three. Awesome, I see your hand up there. See that hand, see that hand. See your hand up there, and up there, up there. Awesome, awesome. Well, do me a favor, would you, would you put your hand on your heart? And would you all repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a savior. 
Thank you for loving me when I didn't care about you. Thank you for running me down when I was running away. Make me new. And if I fall, give me the grace to get back up. Put people in my path who will lead me towards you. I believe that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hey, let's celebrate those people that made that decision. And listen, we want to be a church that doesn't just start you out on your walk and say, good luck. No, we want to walk with you the whole way. So if you made that decision and you're like, where do I start? Uh, at, the, at the exit areas, you can find these white packets. There's so many things in there that can be a helpful resource to you on your journey. There's a, a 30 day devotional book that our pastors have written that helps uh, you just really understand what happened and where do I go from here. There's some cards that can help you get baptized and all that good stuff. And, and if you need, you know, don't take them right there. And if you need help, ask one of our section hosts. They have some tags on them that says, how can I help you? They would love to help you. Uh, anyway, before we leave today, you know that my dad always likes to say something. Uh, and so he prepared a video that he left behind, which is awesome of him because he just loves to be with his church. So would you turn your attention to the screen? Let's hear from Pastor. Hey, church family. I'm sure you guys really enjoyed service today. And I hope you and yours are enjoying this short break we have before we head into the holidays, right? As you know by now, Tamara and I are at the annual Vision Summit that's organized by RUN Ministries. And RUN wonderfully resources 2 million house church leaders who are doing God's work in some of the darkest, most difficult conditions in the world. I've been a board member of RUN now for three years, and it's really made me appreciative for the courage believers live with that causes God to expand in really challenging places. Tamara and I look forward to being back with you next weekend, and I look forward to bringing our final message in this series, Sync. But as we prepare our tithes and legacy offerings for God's work today, I just want to say thank you for your commitment to God's kingdom. This week, we heard from a retired Christian U.S. military general who served bravely in Afghanistan, just like some of you bravely served who are veterans of war. And we heard from other leaders who are in everyday contact with Christian leaders and Christ followers who are serving bravely in these dark, dangerous places. And their stories so inspired us. Apostolic teams are reaching out to those without an understanding of Jesus, whether it's legal or whether it's illegal. And they're doing it in spite of intense persecution and the Holy Spirit's doing miracles, just like Jesus promised that he would. We also heard sad stories of martyrdom among apostolic team members who are ministering courageously and among believers working to rescue child soldiers and child brides who've been kidnapped by fanatical Muslim fighting forces and then forced to serve that horrible agenda against their own will. I thought of Jesus' words this week in Acts 1-8 when he told his followers, God's will is for us to be witnesses in our Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. You know, the New Testament church didn't even have their first service yet, but Jesus was making sure the right vision was being formed in their heart. And that is he wants his followers to make a difference every day of our lives, wherever we live, but also all over the world. If we don't, the good God wants to do isn't done, is it? It doesn't come into people's world. So thank you for your faithfulness to God's dream. And quickly, let me share our sixth pillar. God calls his church to be built upon so we're impactful in the book of Acts. We're revisiting these at the onset of my 33rd year as your pastor. And first, God calls us to be a convincing church. Thank you for convincing others. Jesus is our answer all around you. He calls us to be a connecting church in worship, but also in our witness to our community. He calls us to be a contagious church, understanding the story of our life speaks powerfully to somebody. He calls us to minister as a community, knowing that there's some things we can't do alone. We best do those together. He calls us to be a compassionate church, knowing not just for what we stand for, but for how we stand for people who need us. And then today, God calls us to be a constructive church, I love Acts 4, 32 to 34, where it says all the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything. 
because they realized God gave them what they had to touch lives. And I want to thank you for being those kind of people who are causing God's will to prevail. She said earlier, uh, how many of you guys are thankful that what our pastors get to be a part of and what we get to be a part of? Um, man, it's awesome. Thank you for, for all that you do, for being faithful and obedient so that we can see God do an awesome work uh, through us. Let's pray over our tithes and offerings together. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give to your work, Lord. Thank you that through our tithes and through our offerings, Lord, you're doing a work in us, in our community, and even all the way around the world, Lord. We're so thankful to be a part of it. And God, we just give, we pray that your blessing would be on the offering this morning, that it would go a long way for your work, and I pray a blessing over the giver. We love you in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Well, hey, can we tell Pastor Jeff, thank you so much for bringing and working so hard to bring us a great message this morning. Hey, before I dismiss everybody, I want to dismiss our veterans and their friends and family first. We have some pies for you guys in the Connection Center from Country Bakery. We have a, some, I was told to tell you we have some sugar-free pies as well. So make your way back there if you want those. Seriously, though, we do. Um, so, man, we love you guys. We appreciate you. We also have photo opportunities if you want to get some photos with your friends and family. So, veterans, you guys are dismissed. And Faith Family, one more time, can we give it up for all of our <laughs> veterans and let them know how much we love and appreciate them? Man, you guys are awesome. So you guys can make your way back to the Connection Center uh, now and beat the crowd. Um, uh, I also want to remind you that if you came and you want prayer this morning, we're going to have our prayer team up front. They would love to pray with you uh, about anything that you need prayer with, uh, prayer for. Please come to the front, and they would love to pray with you, all right? All right, well, can I say a prayer of blessing over you before we go? How am I, how am I supposed to do it here? I don't, I don't, even, I don't even think I do that. <laughs> Let me pray for you, all right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine. I'm laughing at myself. I do that. <laughs> I do say it like that. All right, here we go. Let's change it up. Let's change it up. We're praying. We're praying, guys. Let's pray, all right? Here we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. If you receive it, say amen. All right, you guys have a great day. You're dismissed. <laughs> I love it. Amen. Well, guys, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. We hope that you enjoyed service. What an awesome word. Before you sign off, we always like to ask three questions. What was the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Number two, what are you going to do about it? And number three, how can we pray for you? So before you sign off, drop some of those responses in the comments below. And also, if you prayed that salvation prayer for the first time, or maybe you're rededicating your life today, we just want to say, well done. Thank you for praying that prayer. And we want to let you know that we're here for you. Even though we may be watching online right now, we want you to know that we are truly here for you. We want to, we want to help you walk into your best life with Jesus. Get some helpful resources in your hands. We have a free gift for you that we want to get to you. So let us know that you prayed that salvation prayer. Our moderators are looking for your names right now, and we will get that to you this week. But other than that, God bless you, and we'll see you on Wednesday.